Welcome back, everybody. This is the Funk Bed Nation podcast. I'm Dr. Steve Noseworthy, and my guest today is a, an old friend, and I would say some of a mentor, Dr. Sam Yannick. Uh, Sam, welcome to the show. I am so glad that you made some time to talk with us and talk to everyone in the Funk Med Nation world. Thanks for being here. Thanks, Steve. It's good to be here. I'm happy to see you. Yeah, happy to see you too. It's been a few years since we've been in the same room together. Um, we've known each other, I would say, what, probably about for 15 years, something like that? Yeah, I think that's right. Yeah. And it's unfortunate that we're hardly ever in the same place, but it, I will say that I have uh, watched from the sidelines, if you will, as your career has really kind of morphed and changed quite dramatically in some cases. And so for those who are listening, who don't know who you are, don't know much about your background, why don't you just take a couple of minutes to talk about you know, where you started in the world of functional medicine and, and how things kind of shifted and changed to the point where you are now? And we'll have plenty of opportunity to talk about, you know, maybe it's your pet project, Cogents. I don't know what, I don't know how you think about it yourself. It's a little bit more than a pet project these days, but I'm sure it started out that way. So why don't you just give us a little bio, give us a little background. Sure. Um, uh, went to Cornell University as an undergrad, um, was out in the uh, business world for a while, um, stayed in Ithaca, New York. Uh, after graduating from undergrad because I was doing Chinese martial arts mm. and um, but doing Chinese martial arts with the teacher I had meant that I also needed to study Chinese medicine and meditation and all kinds of things like that. Uh, that got me interested in Chinese medicine and Chinese Qigong things like that. Um, went to uh, chiropractic school, uh, did a neuro postdoc with uh, Carrick Institute Mm -hmm. uh, then studied acupuncture for a while. Uh, around the end of the 1990s, began uh, studying immunology, uh, mainly in response to the fact that I realized that patients needed me to. Mm -hmm. uh, and then uh, that began a 25 or so year by now evolution into pretty much full-time immunology study uh, and working with patients with uh, chronic complex illness, autoimmune, and other. Um, in 2015, uh, I began to create a, a functional immunology course online for clinicians called Cogents Immunology. Uh, and Cogents now has uh, about 7,400 clinicians around the world that have been through the course or are in the course currently. Yep. Um, and, um, you know, it's a self-paced course. Clinicians watch videos at their own pace. And then also we get online once a week and have Q&A. And there's a Q&A forum. People can post questions in and so on. So a pretty lively community there. Yeah. Um, and just always learning something new about immunology, always unfolding the process more. And immunology itself, of course, is this sort of, you know, sort of set of waves that keep keep cresting and, you know, and the process keeps unfolding. And every time you think you really understand something, it turns out to actually be six things, you know? Yep. And so you have to unfold it further. And, and, you know, as, as uh, you get presented with patients that have um, nuances of complexity that haven't been understood yet, you have to yep. try to unfold what's going on there and see if you can help them. Yeah. I, you know, I have this impression, uh, I, and I think you'll agree with the statement, but you can correct me if I'm wrong, <clears throat> that when you look at the spectrum of chronic illnesses and, and patients can present in different places along that continuum, but nevertheless, when they're on this continuum of complexity, that the immune system is always involved in, in one of the challenges to us as clinicians is to figure out how it's involved and then to devise ways to try to remediate that would you do you see this things the same way sure i mean you know there are um sh short answer is yes the you know and then varying versions of the long answer right the right but fundamentally um everything about inflammation everything about the chemistry of stress virtually everything about gastrointestinal function and on and on is all mediated through cells and signaling mechanisms 
right. that are fundamentally immunological. And so it's virtually impossible to talk about any kind of biological dysfunction without immediately talking about the immune system. You know, a person right. has a kidney infection, immune system. Person has heart disease, those foam cells that are depositing into the wall of the artery, those are specialized macrophages. Well, that's the immune system. That's the immune system. And yeah. On and on. You know, brain fog, fatigue, those are immunological states. Any kind of neurological condition, you're talking not just about neurons, but also about the microglial cells, which are specialized macrophages, white blood cells, right. that live in the brain. And you've got 10 of these for every neuron. Neurons are the signaling cells. So it turns out your brain is your biggest immune organ, right? So MS, Parkinson's, dementia, these are all profoundly immunological disorders. Yeah. And, you know, that's a completely different perspective on, like most people think, well, the brain, it's neurological and, and like kind of like a parallel analogy. Everyone thinks that the gut is digestive, you know, yet the, the enteric nervous system, I believe, has more neurons than, you know, vast majorities of, uh, of the brain in the central nervous system. Um, I think it was, I think it was in the nineties. Um, there was a researcher named Tata who coined the term, um, the neuroendocrine immune super system. And he talked about how each of those systems had their own systems. And so each of those systems was in itself a super system, but he, he really, it was the first time that I really um, read someone else who was thinking or writing along these lines that everything is interlaced and interconnected and you can't have a sensible conversation about the brain and the nervous system without also talking about hormones and immunology. You can't, have a sensible conversation about the hormonal system without talking about the brain and immunology. Why is it like, I, I, I get the sense that when you look at those three elements, which are really just different facets of the same entity, that if you were to pick one thing that was the master controller of those three elements of the super system, would you say it's the immune system? And if so, why and how is that true? Well, I mean, I, I think that I, you know, as with all humans, I'm, I'm influenced by, you know, I, what in uh, epidemiology you might think of as this as self-selection bias, right? Mm -hmm. Meaning clinicians tend to think that the world is the way it is because of the experiences they've had right. with their own patients. Sure. So the people who turn out to show up are my window on the world and that creates a bias based on who has decided to come see me that's called self-selection bias people right. select themselves into my practice well so of course if i do useful things that are immunological and my patients improve then i'm going to think ah the immune system is the most important thing you know um whereas a person who you know uh, uh an OBGYN, let's say who focuses on hormones all the time and, and has significant successes often enough to create a psychological reinforcement, just right. as I would on the immunology side, they're going to think, oh, it's all, it's all about the hormones, right? So right. That's and the right. same on the yeah. narrow side. Yeah. I think the most important thing in some sense for clinicians is to have a good sense of discernment about which kinds of cases are an appropriate match for which kinds of treatments. So I would hope that, in fact, I did this yesterday, patient saw a patient as a new patient. And I, you know, the person has um, a lot of brain fog, played a lot of football, you know. And I said to this person, you know, brain cells are two things. They are brain and they are cells. So as cells, I'm gonna work with you on immunological and other biological factors that relate to cellular chemistry for the purposes of advantaging all your cells, including your brain cells. Mm -hmm. At the same time, when you think of brain cells as brain, you're thinking about the nuances of difference between different pools of neurons in the brain. When you think of it that way, you're thinking about the brain more like an orchestra. 
So at that point, you're thinking, okay, I have to get all these instruments, all these different parts of the brain to harmonize in an appropriate way. So if, if the cellos are playing way too slowly, I can't just stimulate all the musicians. In other words, I can't say to a person, go run around a lot because it'll stimulate your brain and that will light up all the lights and everything will get better. Because it, if there's one part of the brain that's functioning too slowly, then a global stimulation isn't going to change the imbalance between that low functioning area and the rest. So someone has to figure out, and this is the role of the functional neurologist, somebody has to get in there and figure out where are the low functioning areas? Where are the over firing areas that need to be down regulated and so on? So, so this guy's case had some immunological components to it, but my sense of it after talking to the guy for two hours was that, um, he needed a functional neurological component to the case mm. it, to succeed. We couldn't just do immunologically interesting things. Even if we did all the right stuff on that side of the equation, there were other parts of it that weren't going to get attended to without that other sure, participant, sure. without the functional neurologist in there. Right. So, so I had a sense that it's not, um, there is no sort of absolute sense of hierarchy. It, it's more that in a given case, um, there may be a sense that, um, you know, if you could pick two of those three things, immune system, hormones, and nervous system, if you could pick the two most important things, whichever they turned out to be for that patient, right. maybe the third one would come along for the ride. Right. Now, there are going to be people for whom that's not true, and all three of the things have to get attended to. Right. Uh, and I'm... I'm forever sharing cases with functional neurologists and functional medicine OBGYNs for that reason. So you, I think what's underlying this part of the conversation is the idea of clinical models, right? How do you, what's the lens through which you see a case? And I don't mean to anonymize individual people, but you, you know, you know yeah. what I mean, right? How, yeah. how do you, what's the lens through which you see it? And and with this idea of selection bias, <clears throat> particularly as we develop our own clinical models based on the experiences and knowledge that we have, I would imagine that one of the one of the most detracting and potentially very problematic issues with developing a clinical clinical model, either subconsciously or consciously, is you don't know what you don't know. Yeah. Right. Right. But yeah. Do you just go ahead and run with that. Sure. Well. So what you're describing there has been formalized as something called the Dunning-Kruger effect. So uh, Dunning and Kruger uh, are psychologists. They, I'm not sure if they're still at University of Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. At the time that they published this work, one of them was a grad student of the other. I forget which one was the grad student, which one was the professor. But Dunning and Kruger in the around, <laughs> a, around 2000, I think. They were at University of Pennsylvania, and in the suburbs of Pennsylvania, um, there was this interesting thing that happened where a guy robbed a bank, robbed two banks, actually, broad daylight, no mask, no nothing, got caught right away. And as they led him away, he was heard to be muttering to himself, the lemon juice didn't work. The lemon juice didn't work. So these two psychologists of course were very interested like what's going on here <laughs> so um they dug into it and here's what turned out to be going on this guy had been told that if you rub lemon juice on your face cameras cannot see you oh and so he rubbed lemon juice on his face he took a selfie or tried to uh his face wasn't in the picture <laughs> And so he decided that that meant that this idea about lemon juice worked. Well, wow. he rubbed lemon juice on his face, walked into a bank and robbed it, went to another bank and robbed it. And of course, the cameras saw him and he got picked up. No problem. Sure. So what these psychologists were really interested in was how could he like, come on, how could you not understand? what you were missing, right? That 
that he just fundamentally had such a such a misunderstanding. And so what they what they came to study in a formal way and publish papers about was simply the notion that people really underappreciate what they don't know. Mm -hmm. And it's more detailed than that. Because it turns out when and they did all they did very interesting experiments to quantify this. And what they found was that there's a curve. So if you have like an XY axis, okay, a vertical axis and a horizontal axis, if the horizontal axis is time and the vertical axis is how certain you feel about your understanding. Oh, well, I'm sorry. The horizontal axis is not time. The horizontal axis is how much you actually know. Okay. There's an implication of learning more with time, but really it's how much you actually know about the time. Right. When you know a little bit, your feeling of certainty goes to a maximum. So you know a little bit, you feel very certain. Yeah. As you go this way and learn more, your certainty goes down, down, yeah. down, down. And then it starts to go back up as you finally become a genuine expert. Mm. But it never goes nearly as high. The certainty feeling never goes nearly as high as at the beginning when you knew a little bit. Right. And this is why when you talk to a real expert about something, they will sound like they don't really know what they're talking about <laughs> because they will say, well, look, here's what we think we understand. Right. And a lot of the time that gets you somewhere, but really there are these other parts of it that we don't understand. And when you try to deploy a strategy based on this, you got to watch out for that. And it right. only works sometimes because, and you say to yourself, this person doesn't know what the heck they're talking about. Right. But if you listen to someone who knows a little bit about a topic, they'll say, well, it's obvious. It's this. And don't you know, everybody who has this needs this. And when you hear a person express that kind of intense certainty, you want to think about the Dunning-Kruger effect. Yeah. And about the likelihood that they know enough about something to be at that certainty maximum, but they don't know enough to have gotten that certainty maximum eroded yeah. by enough experience and especially enough engagement in the real world for that to be beaten down enough as they learn more and more. Yeah. I remember, in, and I've actually said this to other guests on this podcast and, and got immediate agreement, but I remember saying in a functional medicine seminar I taught many years ago, you know, the the smarter I get, the dumber I feel. Right. And and, and I I I mean I I guess I'm the poster child for the chronic Dunning Kruger effect because in the first couple of years of functional medicine, I thought I had it all mastered. Isn't you know? that great? Oh, it's wonderful. I'm so smart and I'm so good. And there's no problem I can't handle until right. you come across a few problems that you can't handle because you don't know what you don't know. Yes. Yeah. And so like for, for me, um, going back to this idea of clinical models, like I, I have this, I have this fascination with the clinical models that, that people in our field employ in practice. Um, and, and I think that we all, even if you don't think you have a clinical model, I think everyone has a clinical model, even though it might be subconscious. Sure. Um, I believe that there are, you know, when you start to, to get to that point where you realize you don't know everything. And so you, you tend to position everything is, well, here's what I think I know. Here's mm -hmm. what I think might be going on. Most of the people that I've met who have that kind of mentality have more of a formalized clinical model that they have come to learn and trust, but they, they realize it's kind of a flexible framework because this is your best guess as about how things work and how you might help somebody with a real problem, that's but right. you're open to other possibilities. So, so I guess that's a long way of me asking, 
like what kind of clinical model have you either intentionally or intuitively formalized? Like I know sure. like immunology is your thing, but I just even based on what you said 10 minutes ago, you know that immunology is a very important part of something that's more complex than just immunology. That's so right. what's your like what's your clinical model? Give me give me some insights into the dark recesses of Dr. Sure. Yannick's mind. Sure. I mean, I think that um, the, the, the first thing is that um, I do think it's important to have a sense of um, a, at least some sense of uh, a, a, a reasonably well-defined territory where as a clinician, you feel some amount of earned confidence. Mm. You don't want to just decide to be confident, right? It needs to be earned. And having a kind of a, um, an unjaundiced view of what you have and have not earned as confidence, I think is important. Now, that's tough when you've been in practice for a year, right? Right. Yeah. Some of the way you might earn confidence is by borrowing it from clinicians who are more seasoned. And there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, I've, I have been forever asking questions of other clinicians. Um, I mean, I, I did it twice yesterday, right? So, you know, there's no, there's no, um, nothing wrong with doing that. Yeah. There's no shame in that. No, not a bit. So, um, so, so the first thing is, you know, where do I detect that I don't feel a sense of earned confidence in the case? And is that something where I can go earn some confidence by reading some papers or by reading some papers and then discussing them with another clinician? Maybe I've got a patient who's got a condition that's rare. You know, and, and if, if I haven't seen, I mean, I remember in the early 1990s, uh, a patient came to see me who had uh, lymphangia leomyomatosis, which is a rare lung condition where the lung cells develop estrogen receptors. And I said to the patient, I've never heard of this condition before. And she said, good, I, now, now I know you're honest because nobody's ever heard of this, except you know, except spec, you know, pulmonary specialists who know sure. what that is. So, so you're going to run into stuff you've never run into. That's fine. But having a really um, clear sense of what it takes to be on a solid footing about a particular part of the case is, I think, in itself an important skill. That's the first thing. Then that's going to help you understand if you have an earned basis for thinking you can be useful. Mm. Then, and believe it or not, I'm working toward an answer to your question. Um, sure. Then it's important to, um, to understand that all humans are, um, I don't know if vulnerable is too diminishing sounding a word, but all humans are available to the effect of intermittent psychological reinforcement, which is a fancy way of saying, um, uh, if, if patients improve, if three out of 10 of your patients improve, that's like you're a rat hitting a bar and a pellet pops out three out of 10 times, mm -hmm. right? So it's known in the psychology research that intermittent reinforcement is the strongest kind of psychological reinforcement. So let's say I'm an acupuncturist or I'm a chiropractor or I'm a primary care doctor or I'm a whatever. And I have a way of doing things and patients sometimes get better. Oddly, and especially if my treatment tends to be always roughly the same so that it's viewed so that my brain experiences that as I'm doing the same thing. In other words, right. I'm hitting the bar and sometimes the pellet pops out. Sometimes the patient gets better. That instrument reinforcement is powerful. So let's say I'm an acupuncturist. I'm going to think acupuncture is amazing and I'm going to want to do acupuncture with every patient who walks in. Right. I'm going to be convinced that everyone needs acupuncture because I really, really, really want to hit that bar. Yeah. 
that's a problem in clinical practice. Right. <laughs> yeah. Big one. <laughs> so, now, skilled clinicians will know that they can't be singular in what they do, right? So acupuncturists will do other things besides acupuncture. They'll, you know, they'll give the patient Chinese herbs. They'll attend to things like sleep and stress and exercise and so on. They'll do a variety of different kinds of acupuncture. And they'll also recognize when the patient comes in and has a problem that isn't fundamentally about their acupuncture meridian system mm -hmm. or isn't fundamentally uh, changeable through a pattern of biological leverage introduced through the acupuncture meridian system. That's, that's an ordinary thing that good clinicians do. And it doesn't mean that acupuncture isn't any good. Acupuncture is amazing. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, something being amazing doesn't mean it's always what to do. Right. Right. So that's the, that's the first part of a sort of an approach is I think it's really important to know that um, people are, you know, need a variety of different things yeah. and, and having discernment about what the highest level match is. It, it gives you a sense of, okay, it, it, what has to be included with this patient is whatever, whatever that thing is. And if it's not, if it's not me, okay, it's not me. And that's yeah. okay. Yeah, and it's it, it makes me think uh, about a lot of the the potential downsides because I do think there are upsides of like these practice management groups in in the world of functional medicine that have you know kind of in their own way figured out at least in their minds the right way to do functional medicine, and a lot of it is geared towards standardized messaging in terms of marketing social media standardized business practices but even and perhaps to the detriment of the community standardized clinical approaches right if you're in this world of practice management this is how we do functional medicine and so you end up doing kind of a a pre-planned approach which doesn't require a lot of clinical thought process at least a lot of like high level strategic thinking and if i'm hearing you correct correctly Employing that, and even though you might only be helping three out of ten people who sign on to your program, you're still getting reinforced that this is the best way to do it, because you knock well, three out of ten out of the park. I mean, that's a risk. That's a risk in any kind of medicine for anybody, whether they're practicing on their own or practicing with a group or whatever. Yeah. My sense is that um, in functional medicine, everyone who's learning something as a new involvement for them right. is trying to get oriented. Yep. And as they try to get oriented, they'll try to figure out some kind of structure and they'll make use of that structure. And this is also true, by the way, in conventional medicine. I mean, what happens in conventional medicine is you've got the task of taking care of, like in the U.S., you've got the task of, okay, there are 300 million people. We got to take care of these people. Yeah. Right. Wow. I wouldn't want to be in charge of that. That's <laughs> hard. Right. <laughs> Holy mackerel. Now, if you're going to take care of 300 million people and you're going to uh, say something about standards of care, which is, I think, a sensible thing to want to do. Your best goal should be to create a system that takes the best care of the highest number of people, mm -hmm. including that you're not going to be in a position to try to understand everything about every nuance of all those people right. and people's willingness to go along with what you want them to do is going to be limited in a whole variety of ways, some of which are about just their straight ahead willingness. Like, I don't want to do that. I don't want to eat that way. I don't want to take that pill. I don't want to, you know, whatever it is. Right. So you've got a, you've got a partially willing dance partner there, right? And you're going to try to do whatever you can do 
And then whatever's going to happen is going to happen. And some people it's going to go really well. And some people it's going to go adequately well. And some people it's not going to be enough or it's not going to be a good match or it's not going to be discerning enough about some nuance of their biology yes. or it's not going to be paying enough attention to their food or to their stress or right. their genetics or whatever. So you end up with a cadre of people who are not sufficiently served in a, in a convention, a straightforward conventional setting, conventional medicine setting. Now, that's not a knock against conventional medicine, because the truth is you could convene an expert panel and try to figure out the ideal way to do conventional medicine, and you could accomplish that. You could succeed. Your panel could do it, right? Like they could get it right, whatever, whatever objectively right means, they could get it right. Then you could deploy it, and you could deploy it correctly. And all of that could be ideal, but in a population of 300 million people, no system is going to work for everyone. Right. It's not, it's not possible. And therefore there will be people who are looking for something else, looking for something additional, not even necessarily instead of like, I always tell patients that my work is in addition to not instead of. Their right. conventional medicine work. Right. I mean, conventional medicine is amazing. Are you kidding? You get your gallbladder taken out through like three little holes. Oh my God. Are you kidding? And you're not dead? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> we just poked holes in you. Right. I mean, it, it, it's <clears throat> amazing. Or the, you know, the, the um, monoclonal antibody based medications. I mean, these are. Th these are transformative things, right. right? Right. So still, there will be a cadre of patients who need something in addition to that. And there'll be a cadre of clinicians who are interested in helping them, who are interested in digging into their biology. Now, when those clinicians turn their attention to a functional medicine way of thinking about things, what will inevitably happen first is they're going to try to get oriented. They're going to need a framework for that orientation because you can't just say, you just have to learn all the biology and make a map of it in your head and therefore know what to do. That's right. not real. So you have to give people some kind of structure. And at first, what's going to happen is they're going to rely on the structure. And as with almost anything, it's going to be an 80-20 rule phenomenon, right? Where 20% of the knowledge lets you help 80% of the people. Right. Then the remaining 20% of the people are going to take up 80% of your time because you're going to try to figure out what to do for them. Right. And that's going to be the growing edge of your clinical knowledge is, you know, I don't know what to do to help you know, this patient. And so I just have, to, I have to learn more stuff. Yeah. You know, my old mentors, old mentor used to say, your patients will teach you everything if you let them. Yeah. Right. Yeah, I've so, heard you say that before. Yes. So instead of sending someone away, you know, it, it, I mean, you have to figure out, does this patient need something that a colleague of mine already has complete mastery of all right i'm going to send them but if the patient needs something to get figured out and and they've seen a dozen people i'm not going to just pass them on i'm going to dig in and try to figure out okay what's going on here right this should have worked and didn't you know they, they've seen very good clinicians right who did very sensible good things that also didn't work. Well, why didn't they work? What's in the way? What's going on? So asking those kinds of questions, I think, is very important. So right. I think there is a sense that having a framework is important. And, and it lets you, it, it gives you uh, something to sort of 
react to and gives you a way of thinking through in a disciplined way. Okay, what do I think the, the first set of steps should be? Why do I think that? Right. Right. So it's not, so it's not just sort of chaos, right? You, you right. can't, you can't imagine that, that any of these horses could win and you're just going to r- bet randomly on one of them. You need to know the likelihoods of different clinical maneuvers being useful with different kinds of case presentations. Yeah. Now, what I always say to patients is, okay, we're going to spend a couple of hours. We're going to develop an, a map of what I think your case is about. We're then going to get labs, a lot of labs. We're going to use the results of those labs as an overlay that helps us understand that map better, correct some things, certain certain things get bigger in how much we think they matter, certain things get smaller and so on. Then I'm going to give you some instructions. I don't want you to think that I know the truth about your case. And I don't want you to think that the instructions I'm giving you are somehow right or correct. I only want you to think that this case map is a a reasonable first approximation that leads to this first set of clinical steps. Hmm. And then ultimately, you're going to tell me in a month, we're going to connect again, you're going to tell me what you observed, Mm -hmm. about how you feel, about how you function, and your observations are going to teach me more because they're going to give me a sense of, okay, I see. So, you know, your your joints don't hurt anymore and your guts are better, but your brain fog is no better or whatever the configuration is. So that means this, 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 this. And we're going to go through a series of cycles of work. And every cycle of that work is diagnostic. And as many of those cycles as possible are also therapeutic. Right. Okay. So, you know, as I'm listening to you, I'm realizing, and I'm... <laughs> I'm surprised that I haven't thought of this before is that, you know, when anytime we, we take on a new client in the functional medicine space, there's, there's this complex interplay between the clinician's psychological profile and the patients. Mm-hmm. Right. And, 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 and that's probably something that, I mean, certainly it's not something that I've thought of, like what, how is my psychological makeup affecting how I approach this problem. So what you just laid out is basically self-awareness, transparency, and being honest in communicating to the person that you're trying to help. Like, I don't know everything. And and that seems to be directly opposed to what a lot of clinicians think they should do, which is projecting this air of confidence and certainty you have this, I know how to fix it. I'm the only one who can help you. If you go somewhere else, I don't know who's going to help you. Right. So just take that idea because I'm struggling to put the thoughts together. Yeah. I mean, I, I think that, um, I mean, I can only speak for myself, you know, I, I think that, um, it is natural for a patient who's been struggling for a really long time it's natural for a patient who's been struggling for a long time to feel sort of reticent about trying again. Yeah. Right. I mean, it takes a lot to get up off the couch when you feel crummy and you've tried to figure out how to feel better and people, you know, well-meaning smart people have tried to help. Yes. And it hasn't worked. And things that there's a reasonable expectation could be helpful haven't worked. Right. Now, you know, you go through a bunch of experiences like that, and you might say to yourself, you know, um, this is just how it's going to be for me. And what I really have to do is accept that this is how it's going to be for me. And my best move as a patient is not to keep trying. It's exhausting. It's expensive. Mm-hmm. It's disappointing. It, it puts me into this sort of hope and disappointment cycle. Right. 
why, why in the world would I sign up for that? Right. Yeah. So I think it's sensible for a patient who's having that experience. If they do decide to try again, it's sensible for the patient to want some kind of reassurance that says, Hey, look, if I'm going to do this with you, <laughs> right? I need to know that you are confident that you can help me. Right. So of course it makes sense that a patient would want that. At the same time, um, speaking as the clinician and as much as I understand that impulse, I think my job is to take the time to sit with a patient, really listen to the story of what their experience is, listen to what their experience and all of the work that's been done by other doctors can teach me about the case, try to make as detailed a biological map as I can, see if that map suggests clinical targets that are worthy of attention, and then also, oftentimes, cast a wider net of lab testing. And it doesn't mean, you know, thousands upon thousands of dollars of fancy specialty tests. A lot of it is just stuff from normal, you know, national right. reference laboratories that just hasn't been done. Right. Because it wasn't sort of thought of as, a, you know, connected to what their diagnosis is. So doing those kinds of labs is often helpful. But in that process, what I'm trying to do at each step of the way is to say, here's what I think I understand so far. And here's what I think that means about what might be useful to do. Mm -hmm. But if the question is, <laughs> am I sure I can help the person? I, I always say very honestly, you know, how, how would I know such a thing, right? I, I <laughs> can tell that's you. That's a great way to say it. Hey, right, I, I can tell you that I, you know, I'm accustomed to being useful in complex situations that have been hard to make progress with. I'm accustomed to that. But until I see the patient actually improve, I don't know, and the patient mm -hmm. doesn't. Right. The flip side so, of that is can, I, can I interrupt you? I'm yeah, sorry to interrupt you because I know you're on on a roll, but I'm yeah. I'm listening to the language that you use, and and it are you is this just simply the way that you talk, or do you spend time really thinking about how do I phrase this to communicate it? Like saying I'm accustomed to being useful in complex cases. Like is that no. just the way that Sam talks, or did you think that through? I mean. You know, I've been in practice for 31 years, so I guess this is just how it's evolved, yeah. you know. Um, and I can tell you, in the 1990s, I thought I had to know everything about every case. Mm. That was terrible. That's a, a lot mm -hmm. of pressure. It's a lot of pressure. Yeah. And it's also a distortion. Because it's not true, right? I mean, I, I didn't pretend that I knew everything. I wouldn't, you know, I wouldn't like be dishonest with people, but I thought that I had to spend time studying everything right. so I could catch up and know everything. No, that's so terrible. Does that, so may, maybe we can use that as a segue into talking a little bit about cogents hmm. um, because I... I don't know if anyone has ever said this to you or if you've had this thought yourself, but I, I would be very tempted to uh, perhaps label you as the father of functional immunology. Oh, well, I know, I, know. It's, I'm sorry to put that, that pressure on you, but, but it seems to me like um, I, I, I tend to think that I have a, a better grasp on immunology than the average clinician because we all come out of our basic training, whether your credentials are DCMD, DOM, doesn't, ND, doesn't really matter. None of us learn immunology well when, when we're in school. 
And I would say that most practicing clinicians continue on without a robust understanding of the fundamentals. Now you've taken that and you've like you and I have had many, and as well as, you know, some of the groups that you and I have been connected to, we've taken our understanding of immunology beyond the fundamentals into maybe some level of complexity. You've gone way beyond that in the curriculum that you've created with cogents. And, and for, listen, any, for anybody listening here who wants to know about immunology from a functional medicine perspective, cogents is the place to go, but be prepared. It is a rabbit warren of rabbit warrens, right? There's so much, there's so much depth and detail going back to what you said in the beginning, you, like you discover one thing and discover that one thing is really six things mm -hmm. and it continues to unfold and unfold and unfold. New research gets piled on old research and it's a never ending battle. You'll never know everything about immunology, right? Cause the next discovery is just around the corner and there's a yeah. lot of stuff already published that we don't know that we don't know. So, I, I mean, I'm sorry, I, I feel like I embarrassed you by saying that, but I, I, d I don't see any other person or group taking immunology education to the level that you have with cogents. And, and I mean that sincerely. I really, truly sure. do. So where, like, where in your professional development did you just start going, oh, I'm just going to start, I'm going to make a course? Because initially this was for your benefit so that you could feel comfortable that you're going to be useful to the next complex case that walked in. Yeah. Like where yeah. was the, where was the transition point for you? Yeah. I think, um, I think for me, what happened is what has always happened for me, which is if I don't understand something well enough to make a map of it, I feel like I don't understand it at all. Yeah. And so that means I have to go pretty far into something to have enough pieces to make the map. Right. And, um, and then also I think, um, before I can make a map, it, it feels, I, I, I have a feeling of, um, man, I'm just not getting this, you know? Mm. So with immunology, it took me a long time. I, I had the great good fortune of having good teachers. And um, I began to be able to map out some basic things. They connected to some other things. And, you know, although immunology is in some sense enormously complex, there are sort of um, themes that let navigation take place. Sure. You know, if you look at a map of the world, there are the continents. And then if you're looking at, you know, let's say Europe, you know, you can subdivide, subdivide, subdivide. You know, now you're talking about what are the cities in Italy? Mm -hmm. And now you're talking about, okay, let's look at Milan and let's mm -hmm. look at the different neighborhoods in Milan. Right. Then you're talking about a particular neighborhood in Milan. Then you're talking about a particular restaurant that has the best gluten-free pizza in Europe <laughs> in Milan, right? In Milan, right. So, you know, the, so there are sort of different levels of specificity. And um, so, so I, I began assembling and assembling and my patients, you know, I began to see more and more transformative things happen. And I began to understand themes more easily. And so, you know, one of the things that's common to discover is from a clinician's point of view, patients come in and as you see them through a different lens, you realize that you've been seeing a certain kind of thing all the time, but you didn't know what it was or you didn't think of it in that particular way. And so the amount of clinical actionable leverage you've got changes when your capacity to recognize patterns improves right so in terms of the course i mean the course is you know 240 or so videos in a self-paced course and so on 
But the first group of videos in that introductory module really gives you the whole framework. You don't yeah. need to study the entire course. And no, I was actually going to, I'm sorry to interrupt again, but I was going to ask that question, like how much, because we know that the learning is never ending. Yeah. How, how much do you need to know to be that person who's reasonably confident that they're going to be useful? I mean, uh, like, and, and I'm not going to ask you to map it out, but yeah. how many layers of detail does the Cogents program in its entirety go beyond that fundamental mastery? Yeah. Well, I, I mean, I think, first of all, it goes pretty far. But then also, in some sense, the things that you learn in the introductory module put you in a position to be a good navigator of cases. Mm. And put you in a position. I mean, one of, the, one of the things that I love hearing the most is when a clinician says to me, I had a patient with an unusual disorder. I pulled a bunch of research papers about that disorder. And although I've never studied this disorder before, and I've never read those papers, I understood yeah. what they were saying. Right. Because I have the language, yeah. I have a sense of the territory. And, you know, even though I've never been to Spain, I've never been to Madrid, I know what a city is, I right. know what a bus is, I know what a hotel is, I know what a taxi is, I know what a park is. Right. So I can I can take a taxi to a restaurant and have a meal and then go walk to the park and walk around, you know, and I know what I'm doing. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. Right. Because you've got that navigational skill. Right. And that gets you most of the way there. And whatever it is that doesn't that that isn't taken care of by that, that's about the individual nuances of that unusual case. Well, okay. Now you've bracketed those nuances and you just take care of it. Yeah. So what was what was the genesis of the idea to put this into a course rather than just keeping it as your own, you know, part of your own eclectic knowledge base that you might share with colleagues periodically rather than formalizing it into a course? Sure. Well, I had been thinking about it for maybe a year or maybe two before starting to make materials. I had been talking to uh, local uh, colleagues here uh, and teaching them things uh, that I had been learning from other colleagues, you know, colleagues that were more sort of in the research world. Yep. And I had been talking to uh, friends here locally about um, what I had been um, learning from the research world and translating into practice. Um, and then they were making observations as well about, you know, deploying those those uh, pieces of information and getting clinical leverage. And I I began thinking about uh, formalizing that, um, uh, and and then, you know, it just unfolded from there. And then of course there's all of the um, there's there's a whole piece of the endeavor that is about what it takes to create the technology mm -hmm. to put course materials like that into an online format so right. that they're accessible by, you know, however many hundreds of people want to watch a certain video all at once. Right? Yes. Or, yeah. and, and all of that is a learning curve that has nothing to do with the immunology. Yeah. Um, and so it's just very, very fortunate to um, connect with people on the IT side who were um, kind of remarkably masterful at um, at making all of that straightforward. Right. You know, they're, they're, right. That's a, a black box. You know. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, no. It's, um, yeah. You don't know what you don't know on that one. That's right. <laughs> so I'm super grateful that someone else. It's like a referral, right? Like yeah, you know, this that's right. Yeah. You'll see this person because yeah. it's not it's not in my it's not in my domain. The yeah. IT not in my domain. So I'm very, very grateful to have really, really good people to partner with there. Yeah. You've uh, a couple of times in the conversation, you've talked about mapping out your understanding of someone's set of problems. Yeah. How do you do that? Do you do that in your head? Do you do it on paper? Do you use whiteboarding? How do you, how do you do it? And then how do you share that with your clients? Yeah, I do it. Um, uh, you know, a, a first, a first visit 
with a new patient is two hours. It's a two hour Zoom. And about an hour and 20 minutes into it, um, I'll know enough. Yeah. Um, and I'll say, okay, we're going to pause for a minute and I'll, you know, I got a I have note. I have notes that I've been making, but I'll know enough from the notes and I'll take a blank eight and a half by 11 piece, excuse me, piece of paper, um, you know, like printer paper and I'll just start drawing and I'll just draw freehand a map. And then I'll scan it and I'll put it up on the screen so they can see it. I see. Okay. And we talk through it. Um, and it just helps to, um, you know, sort of it's unfair to a patient to just have someone on a Zoom talking techno details at them without them having some kind of tangible sense of, okay, this is what he's talking about. And so right. I, then I send them. I send it to them as a JPEG, you know, send them the map yep. as a JPEG. Sure. So then they've got a sense of, okay, I see. This connects to this because the thing is, in a complex case, you're unlikely to win in a complex case if you think of it as a list. Patient mm -hmm. has this and this and this and this and this. You're not going to win. Yep. Because that leads to, we need to do these three things for item one and these two things for item two. And these things for item three. Now you got a dozen supplements or whatever, and dietary instructions and exercise and sleep and whatever it is. It, it's 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 a it's a disconnected list of ideas. That's that, that's not as useful, right? Yeah. If you see it as a map, and I always say, I think of it as like a, an overhead map, like an aerial view of a small Italian town, right? And you've got little roads going all these different ways. And if you want to figure out why the traffic is all messed up in that town, you need an aerial view during rush hour. That's going to tell you useful things. Yeah. Right? So if you map it, you can see where the crucial points of convergence are. And you can see what the self-reinforcing loops are. And of course, this person stays chronically ill because look at how A is, you know, is turning into B, C, and D. And what do you know? D reinforces A. Yeah. And also B goes this other way to something else that also reinforces A. And so the pattern of illness tends to be an entrenched set of reinforcing loops that sustain the illness pattern. Right. So how are you going to intervene in a way that disrupts those patterns of reinforcement? Right. So that the, the sort of the machine of the illness, you're trying to break the machine of the illness. You're trying to degrade the efficiency with which the machine maintains its self-reinforcement. When you say the machine, you're talking about all these self-reinforcing loops that keep the dysfunction going. That's right. Yeah. So what I mean, what do these maps look like? Is it just, you know, circles and labels and arrows that connect different yeah. things? And and I'm I'm yeah. wondering how much detail that you put into these, particularly, you know, with the types of clients that we serve who quite often have limitations on brain endurance or focus and concentration, you get an hour and a half into a two hour consult mm -hmm. and now you start mapping things out to show them. Yeah. How do you, how do you gauge how much they can handle without crashing their brain just because of the information overload yeah. and the prolonged conversation and focus? Like how do you manage all that stuff? If patients need breaks, we take breaks. Okay. Also, I'm not, um, the first reason I'm mapping it out is because if I'm going to be useful to them, I need to understand it. Yeah. It's not a sort of a demonstration of my something or other. It's I'm actually going to use this map. Right? Yeah. yeah. Uh, I'm making the map because I need the map. If I'm So you pull useful. that out periodically and you refer sure. back to that when you do your follow-up. Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, absolutely I do. Yeah. Yeah. I mean it's an instrumental tool. Yeah. Then also as I'm as I'm showing them the map, 
and I'm drawing on the screen, like it's, it's a bunch of boxes and arrows and so on. And, you know, they can see all that. I'm also drawing on the map on the screen. So I'm drawing on the screen too, to sort of reinforce, okay, this goes this way and so on. So once you see it as a map, it's not enormously complex. Mm. You know, if I say to a person, your body inflammation, body inflammation is known to promote brain inflammation. Brain inflammation is known to reduce how much serotonin and dopamine you can make in your brain. So you won't have as much motivation and you'll be more depressed for reasons that are biological. And also brain inflammation, central nervous system inflammation turns on a substance you make in your hypothalamus, which is a little area in the brain. That substance is called CRH. And CRH turns on fight flight mode, your sympathetic nervous system. Now you're more anxious. When your sympathetic nervous system turns on, it turns on the production of some inflammatory substances in white blood cells in the body called macrophages. Well, now your body's inflamed because of that. And body inflammation turns on brain inflammation, which turns on the CRH, which turns on fight flight mode, which turns on body inflammation. Well, pretty soon it sounds like your body inflammation is contributing to why you might have depression and anxiety right. and brain fog because of the brain inflammation. Right. It's not that complicated. Yeah. Right. And yeah. then also the chemistry of the stress response causes a, causes a, a mechanism that has a fancy name, but what it amounts to is that certain kinds of white blood cells that are responsible for killing viruses and bacteria, the numbers of those get reduced. So your ability to kill viruses and bacteria is reduced when you have a lot of stress chemistry. So technically cortisol and norepinephrine cause apoptosis of Th1 cells and natural killer cells, right. and they promote the Th2 response. But you don't need to know all that technical stuff. You just need to know that the right. more stress chemistry you have, the harder it's gonna be for your immune system to kill viruses and bacteria. And then, of course, if you have more of viruses and bacteria, more of a burden of that stuff in your body, that's been shown in the research to increase inflammation. Well, now we're back to your body being inflamed, making your CNS inflamed. That yeah. drives sympathetic nervous system. So it's not hard to see how quickly these things become entrenched with each other and looped into these reinforcing patterns. Yeah. And it's not... Um, it's not a rocket science-y kind of a thing, you know? You know, it's, it seems to me that that's an immensely, immensely useful tool um, to organize your clinical thought process, but also to give, like you said, to give someone something to hold on to. That's a graphical representation of the interconnectedness of all, all these problems. And, and again, I think it's it's far more useful to do that, as you said, than just to list out here's your problems and here are the supplements that we use to fix those problems. Do you do you use that diagram? And obviously in your mind you have more detail that you understand that you don't put onto the diagram itself. Right. But do you use that and then your sense of where that core mechanism is to then inform your choice of diagnostic testing? Sure. And and of course to be clear, everyone's diagram is different. What I just described is a kind of a common example of a common sure. yeah. component, right? So right. in some sense, you can think of it as um, if you think of the map of immunology, like, you know, there's how the immune system works in a generic sense. And that might be analogous to the, the map of all the streets in Milan, okay, or in whatever, you know. I like Milan because it's a city that has a lot of windy, you know, <laughs> it's not Manhattan sure. where it's a grid, right? So, right. so um, there's, there's immunology per se, which is um, all the pathways and cells and so on. 
Then there's a question of how much activity there is in a certain part of the immune system or a certain set of mechanisms. Then there's the genetic, there are the genetic components about gene expression of one sort or another, meaning a person is especially good or not so good at a certain right. kind of immunological function. So all of these things are layers. So it is possible to make the map of immunology or the sort of set of maps, mm -hmm. but, but then the, the individual person's map that I draw is more like you got trouble over here, connected to trouble over here, connected to trouble over here. It's not the map of immunology. It's the map of what's interesting about their own particular. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And, and also there's another bracketing, which is there are levels of intracellular and intranuclear mechanisms that that are enormously complex that you that as a clinician you don't need to dig down into all that much so you're you're right. talking things like transcription factors like stat3 or tbed or that kind of stuff yeah i mean that those kinds of things if you know some basic things about those things you're all set but you don't need to worry from a clinical deployment point of view. You don't need to know about this different jack stat mechanism or, you know, SOX one, two, three, et cetera. There are all kinds of levels of complexity about signaling mechanisms yep. that, that you're not, that you don't need to know the details of. So there's sort of like, yes. you know, I, I have a car. I know how to drive it. I don't need to know, you know, how the carburetor works or even, you know, in 2023, if my car even has a carburetor, right? That's right. Yeah. So different, different people will be focused on different levels of nuance and detail. And a person can spend their entire life as a researcher on a particular thing that is of crucial importance. As a clinician, you may not need to know anything about that. Right. Right. So to the extent that I need to know those things from a clinical relevance and leverage point of view, I'll drill down into them. But clinicians, by and large, that, that's that's not necessary to get where you yeah. need to. Yeah, and that was that was the reason for my question earlier about how much of this do you really need to know to be useful at a clinical level. Um, you yeah. know, it's always nice to know the extra detail, but that, you know, that's kind of like tickles your own need for, um, for, for the, the depth and the breadth of the knowledge. And, and I get that because I'm kind of wired the same way sure. is that if I come across something new, I will study it in much more detail than actually is practically useful when I get in front of a client and say, okay, here's what I think. Here's, here's what I think is going to be helpful. That's right. And, you know, from a cogent's point of view, that introductory module, those, it's about four hours of video is going to yeah. get you that, that basis, that basic leverage that you need that yeah. will be transformative. And when you come across a patient for whom that core set of knowledge, you know, knowledge points and tools and so on, if that isn't getting you there, the rest of the course you can use as a learning library. So yeah. you have there's a topic index. You can just look up whatever yeah. topic you want, find the videos on that topic, look at those videos. Yeah. And you have all the Q and A's and, and everything. And, yeah. and those are all recorded and stored in the database, right? We do not record the Q and A. Well, the, oh, the you Q know. and A okay. forum, the question threads when a person posts yes. a question in the online forum. Yeah. There are well over a thousand threads. You can search those threads. There's a uh, an online webinar once a week. We don't record those because I don't want people to feel like, oh, I'm being recorded. I don't want to ask a stupid question. Right. So if you post a question in the forum, the question and the answers and so on, all that back and forth. Yeah, you can search those for sure. But the yeah. webinar, no, that's that's just that's just on the fly. 
Yeah. So I, I know um, I probably have to clue up our time here, and I, I appreciate all the time that you've given us. Sure. Um, what what advice would you give somebody? I think I know the answer, but let, let's imagine practitioners in three different stages. Let's say there's there's a new doctor of any credential background, just new in practice, and wants to learn about the functional immunology aspect of functional medicine, at least the way I see it. Functional immunology kind of fits up in that overarching concept of functional medicine. Yeah. So where where do you say they start? Like what 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 are the basics? Is it just those first four modules of cogents, and that's you know just start there? Yeah, go to the introductory module. I mean, you can join the course without a fee. It's a sponsored course, so there's no fee. You just go to cogentsimmunology.com. Uh, I'm sure you can post the post the link. In yeah, the, I'll put I'll put the link in the know. description for sure. Yeah. yeah. So you just yeah. go there. Um, you'll see on the visitor homepage that there's a link to click to get to the coupon. You enter the coupon in the shopping cart. It takes the cost from three thousand dollars down to zero, and you're yeah. in. Um, yeah. And just it's an amazing. Walk, yeah, yeah. We're very we're very happy about it. And you know, I mean, to me, the thing that's that means the most is how many people have learned how much stuff and helped how many people. You know, that's yeah. just really gratifying. So, yeah. you know, you go into the course and you just study the intro module. Um, if you study the intro module, you know, what most people do is they absorb the intro module and then they, they bounce around to other videos, depending upon what they're interested in. If it's dysbiosis or biofilms or, you know, brain fog and fatigue or mast cell stuff mm -hmm. or autoimmune stuff or, you know, concussion or just whatever it is. Yeah. Um, People tend to also make their way gradually through in a kind of a linear way. A lot of people are doing some combination of both where they're sort of gradually eating the course and then they're also bouncing around because they have a patient with such and such. And so, so they're looking at the videos about that. So just topical. Um, yeah. Yeah. But if yeah. you, if you just go to the intro module and digest that, you'll just be miles yeah. ahead. Yeah. And I'll, I'll dispense with the other two theoretical doctors because i think the answer is going to be the same thing because we're all so poorly trained immunology the starting point is the same for pretty much all of us um so what do you and, and this will be the last couple of questions like what are you number one what are you most proud of uh, in, in the things that you've done in your career and the second question is what would you go back and do differently if you could ah interesting well um i'm certainly very proud of my kids um uh, and yeah, and that's no fool. Um, I would say, uh, professionally, um, uh, I mean, I'm very proud of cogents, certainly. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm, uh, I, I'm really proud of the clinicians who dig into the material, uh, make it their own, ask really good questions. Um, you know, uh, the, the way they move. They're like, the your, they're like your kids, Sam. You're like, you're proud well, of your kids, right? <laughs> well, I mean, some of them have been in practice a long time, you know, yeah. and it's, it's great to see how remarkably skilled they are, uh, mm -hmm. and how many different backgrounds they're from. Um, so that's, that's been really, um, wonderful. Um, yeah. And, um, you know, I'm, I, I really enjoyed, um, it's a paper I published in Frontiers in Psychiatry in 2019 on neuron microglial interaction, um, wow. that I feel like was a really good paper. Um, and then, Do we, uh, can we get a kit? Is that free online or can we get a link to that? Yeah, I can send you a link for sure. It's free. All the Frontiers yeah. papers are free. So if you just Google the word Frontiers and the name Yannick, it will come up. Yeah, you can just Fine. download. Okay, it. I'll put that in the description as well. Sure, sure. Um, certainly, very proud of the paper um, that some colleagues and I published in um, um, IMCJ uh, Integrative Medicine and Clinicians Journal in 2020. That was about COVID. Um, that has held up quite, quite well. You know, it's challenging when you publish a paper early in the pandemic. You want to get good information out early in the game. But then, yep. 
you know, we published it in May of 2020 when the amount of knowledge was not complete, let's say. So there's always a risk that you get it wrong. So we spent months, or at least I spent months, reading all the papers that came out subsequently and to see, okay, how do we do? And really yeah. it holds up very, very, very well. So, yeah. so, so I, I do remember that. seeing, I do remember seeing that when that came out. Yeah. So, um, you know, I don't, I don't publish all the time, but certainly when I have something to say, um, I certainly will. And I was, I was um, grateful to be part of the group that published that paper. I thought it was really interesting. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. 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 What would you do? What would you go back and do differently if you could? Oh, um, I would understand the Dunning Kruger effect. <laughs> <laughs> so that I would, um, at times when I felt really certain about something, yeah. I would understand that to be evidence that I was at that certainty maximum, which uh, I should and now do take as an indication that I have a lot to learn that would get me from my certainty peak down mm -hmm. and across and yeah. up the other side through of the, the valley. <laughs> yeah, through the valley. Maybe, maybe to some <laughs> more, more um, developed perspective yeah. and more thorough, but nonetheless incomplete understanding of whatever I'm trying yeah. to understand. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Final question. What does Sam Yannick do in his spare time? Ah, um, exercise, go for walks with my wife, uh, do Tai Chi, uh, cook, 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 yeah. eat, eat. Um, <laughs> see friends, see friends is, is a, is a big thing. A big um, yeah. certainly see my kids as much as I can. Uh, we're fortunate to have one of them sort of within striking distance. Um, Good. Zoom, of course, also helps a lot. So, yeah. Yeah. yeah sure. Well, Dr. Dan, thanks for all the time that you've given us. And uh, I hope that somewhere along the way, you can get you back again and we'll talk more stuff because there's so much more to talk about. Sure. That would be delightful. Thank you, Steve. I appreciate your time and uh, appreciate you Thank having you. me.